Well, everybody, here we are, John Mark Comer with Joshua Becker of becomingminimalist.com for our last little session on kind of some of the real nuts and bolts, like how that, like we're all at how level. If you want the why or even the what level behind simplicity, or if you prefer minimalism, go back and listen to our teaching series and podcast. But we're really here for the how, like how do you do this kind of room by room and area of your home. So we covered the closet to start off kind of your uh, your wardrobe or apparel and then kind of living areas and bedrooms. Now, Joshua, I would love to get a little coaching for you from some of the kind of the workhorse rooms. So let's just group together bathrooms, laundry room and kitchen, which is where stuff just kind of starts to pile up. And we have, you know, often duplicates of all sorts of things from extra sheets for the spare bedroom to spatulas or whatever. How would you like, all right, let's say somebody has gone through their closet, gone through their kind of living area to get rid of that extra vase or bookshelf they don't need or put away the records or donate that old DVD collection, gone through the bedrooms and got the TV out maybe or whatever it is. And now comes, all right, the, the kitchen where, you know, the average person has some insane uh, over a thousand items in the average American kitchen. And that's just like, that's not for rich people. That's middle of the board kind of stuff. How, where would you start with bathrooms or laundry room or kitchen? What order? What coaching do you have for us? Uh, I would tell people to start in bathrooms. Uh, I I've, I've found the kitchen to be really intimidating. I was very nervous about decluttering the kitchen. Um, the, the bathrooms I think were a little bit easier to do. There's a little more, Hey, straightforward. I use this. I don't use this. Um, I, I could kind of feel in a, in a decluttered bathroom, like it, it feels great in the morning to get ready and Hey, this is much easier. This is much more efficient. Um, this feels good, uh, in the morning as I'm getting ready or, or getting, or it's more calming as I get ready for, um, for bed at night. So, um, bathroom and laundry are probably a little bit easier for people than the kitchen. Got um, it. for the, uh, for the kitchen, I, <clears throat> I forget where I stumbled upon the article, uh, but I would send everyone who listens to this to go read it. Hopefully you haven't used up your allotment of free New York Times articles yet this month, uh, or you have a subscription. <laughs> but there is a New York Times article, years old by now, uh, and it is called A No Frills Kitchen Still Cooks. Uh, A No Frills Kitchen Still Cooks is written by Mark Bittman, um, and he... Um, he, it's a fascinating article where I forget the exact amount of things. I think he narrows the list down to like 35 items. Uh, and here he is as professional chef. And he says, you can make pretty much anything made in any of the finest kitchens in the world. If you own just these 35 utensils and he lists them out in, in incredible detail. And I, I read that article. I was deathly afraid of doing the kitchen. And I, I printed out the article and I took it into my kitchen and I pulled out all of those 35 things that he listed and I, I set them aside on the table. And then I looked at how much stuff I had left over in my kitchen, like drawers full of things and cabinets full of things and a pantry full of things, like the egg yolk separator and the, I was making like the, the awesome blossoms back then, like a, an onion cutter and deep <laughs> fry and like all this, all this stuff. And I said, okay, according to Mark, I don't need any of those things to cook all the things that I cook. And to be quite frank, my grandma, who was a better cook than, than most anyone I know, like she didn't have any of these things. And while I kept a few of those things going forward, it gave me like all the freedom in the world to begin saying, okay, I can get rid of this and I can get rid of that. And it was just, uh, it was a very helpful, very practical article that, that I read. Yeah. You make the point that most of our grandmothers or grandfathers cooked more often than we do and better than we do and had a fraction of the kitchen utensils and such that we have today. We think like we, man, it's just marketing, right? Like we get sold all these 
these things that we need and it's going to make everything easier and it's going to make it more convenient and you're going to enjoy making all these uh, things if you have all these different utensils. But I have found that there is, I did not love cooking uh, until I simplified my kitchen. And I, I just found that there is a, a joy in knowing what the tools are that I have, uh, knowing how to use them, um, not looking to shortcut the process, but learn how to cut vegetables with a knife as opposed to dicing it with some pampered chef dicer or something like, I, I think right. when you, when you limit it to, to just the essential tools, I have found that the cooking became far more enjoyable. It, it became something that I began to enjoy the process of rather than just something I was trying to get through to get to the eating part of the meal. Um, and I, I don't know if I know how to explain it other than I just began to enjoy the process um, much more when I began to simplify the tools in my kitchen, which I never would have expected. Yeah. You know, I've been learning to cook over the last, I don't know, five years or whatever, and I'm a bit of a slow learner, but I'm loving it. Just loving to cook the family dinner on a regular basis and kind of split the cooking duties with my wife. We also love to cook together. And you're right. As I think about it, as I'm reading your list here from that article, man, it's just such a small number of items that I use over and over and over again. It is not, maybe that's just because I'm not, I'm not even close to ninja level as a chef. I'm very basic, but and it's just a small number of items that you use. Do you have any kind of big picture rule of thumbs like for whether it's for the kitchen or for laundry room or linen closet or bathrooms? Like I know you write about a kind of a, a rule of thumb of avoid duplicates. And that was so helpful for me even to think about, you know, say the, the sheets or the linens on our bed. Like we don't need two pairs. We just once a week, every Thursday, we strip the bed in the morning and that's the day we clean the house and wash them, put them back on before we go to sleep that night. We don't need two pairs of sheets, you know? We just need one. That's plenty for us. So, you know, some of those kind of, any rule of thumbs like that, or you want to elaborate on that one? Yeah, I mean, that was uh, that was the exact one that, that I was going to say, because especially someone who really struggles with doing this, and I, I'm real nervous about getting rid of something that, I, that I'm going to end up needing down the road, and so I just hold on to everything. Like, I have found that, uh, the duplicates is a, a great place to start because you really don't change your life at all. I, I mean, how many mm, spatulas do you do you use at a time? <laughs> one, maybe two. You know, one if you're are near a sink and you can rinse it in between uh, using things. But we have five and six and seven, and uh, I have found that that doing that. I still have towels. I just have fewer of them. I still have bed sheets. I just have fewer of them. I still have pants. I just have fewer of them. I still have shoes. I just have fewer uh, of them. Uh, we still have a television. We just have fewer of them than, than when we first started. And so it, it really hasn't changed our life um, other than I know where everything is. Everything is my favorite. Um, it, I, I get better at using the things that, that I have. So um, duplicates. The other maybe principle I think is really helpful for people to think through is just that there's more than one way to solve a problem. Um, and I, I noticed that in the kitchen where I had this egg yolk separator, which I'd used once in my life and I was going through the drawer <laughs> and I'm like, well, what if I want to separate an egg at some point in the future? And I'm looking at Mark's list of things and looking through it. And, um, it occurred to me that I can separate a yolk with a spoon that, that I don't need like this special <laughs> tool to do it, that there, that there's more than one way to solve a problem. And, uh, it's a, it's a question that I, that I ask people a lot because they'll say, well, I don't want to get rid of this because I use it. Um, and if you get into that thinking, then you can rationalize holding on to countless things. Yeah, Maybe the question anything. we should Maybe the question we should be asking is, okay, what would I use if I didn't have that? Um, because 
usually we come up with, oh, I would just use this plate instead. I would just use a spoon instead. I would just use that knife rather than this one. And I think a lot of the things that we think we need to keep, um, that we think we need to hold on to to solve a problem are are actually cluttering up our lives um, far more than than actually solving the problems that we need. Same with technology, by the way. Technology is a, a big one. Mm. I mean, if technology isn't isn't solving a problem for us, it's it's only adding um, adding to it. So I think that many of these same principles can be applied there. Yeah, that's true. Famous last words for a, a wannabe minimalist, right? Is just uh, I might use this later or whatever, or I I could need this later, and you know, and again, some of that is a very middle class way to think about it because you might have the means if it's something cheap, you know, to rebuy again should the need come and so i obviously have a high level of awareness for that but i really appreciate your you know what what if you were to flip the question around from do i need what could i need this later to how else could i accomplish the purpose and again you're bringing us back to really one way to think about what simplicity or minimalism is is just a high degree of intentionality and purpose behind your living at every aspect including just the things that you allow into your home you got it, man. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, for, thank you um, for your this conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Any closing words of whether advice or inspiration? Just anything kind of you would say in parting to Bridgetown Church and anyone else listening? Man, I would I would just remind everybody that something you already know to be true that that your life is too valuable to waste chasing and accumulating material possessions. Uh, that there are far more important things for you to be pursuing and accomplishing. That I, I don't think anybody thinks uh, about their greatest goals in life and and thinks I just want to own as much stuff as I possibly can. Uh, we uh, we want to be um, we want to be we want to be followers of Christ. We want we want to accomplish what He's called us to accomplish in life, and um, and and the way we do that is um, by man, by, by directing our, our resources towards him, um, because, uh, chasing the things of this world, um, always, um, always fades and perishes and spoils. Yeah. So well said. Thank you, Joshua. Again, for those of you listening, becomingminimalist.com is Joshua's website, which is just a library with a wealth of information and articles from the last 12 years of his work. And then uh, his most recent book, The Minimalist Home, is is the best kind of all-in-one place. I know step-by-step -step guide literally goes room by room. We are just scratching the surface. He literally goes, here's your linen closet. Here's your laundry room. Here's your garage. Here's your home office. Here's – it's just fantastic. So if you want to chase it down further, all of that's available for you. Joshua, thank you. And to all of you listening, peace. Peace.